I'm John Carter, Senior Editor for Political Economy for the South China Morning Post. Today we're talking to Dr. William Overholt. Welcome. Thank you. Could you give us a quick overview of the theme of your new book? Well, the theme is that China is facing a, a crisis of success. And that sounds like a weird idea. But the idea is if you have an entrepreneur who invents something cool and the business takes off, uh, initially it's run essentially as an entourage of the entrepreneur. And then things get complicated. He needs a lot more money. Uh, he needs to list on the stock exchange. All of a sudden, the organization has to be transformed. And all these Asian miracle economies, like China, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, come to a crisis of success. Uh, they start off with a pretty simple economy. And success means a very complicated economy. Uh, and so they get to the point where uh, certain common things happen. Uh, the big companies find themselves in a squeeze. Uh, in South Korea, the Chebol, the big conglomerates, found themselves uh, in a squeeze that ended with most of them going bust. This is in the 80s. And uh, same thing with the Guomindang conglomerates in Taiwan. In China, we find the state enterprises can't earn back their cost of capital. Second thing that happens, the whole economy finds itself over leveraged. Uh, in South Korea in 1979, inflation was 40%. And Foreign debt was huge. China isn't in that much of a squeeze, but it's over leveraged and the, the government is trying to reduce the leverage. As you say, you're comparing the situation in China now with what happened in South Korea and Taiwan as they evolve both politically and economically. How did those two countries overcome their economic and political complexities, as you put it? They overcame the economic complexities by uh, moving to much more market-oriented economies, uh, and they overcame the, p the political complexities by m moving to democracy. In both cases, the response to complexity was to come up with some mechanism that made a lot of the decisions automatic. Uh, you didn't have to... Uh, t tell the big enterprises what to do, the market told them. Uh, and on the political side, you had these electoral mechanisms. And the response doesn't have to be something that copies the West, but the complexity is an objective problem. You can, you can measure it. And so you, you need both a, a, an economic plan and a political plan. You, you've said that China's economic planning is some of the most sophisticated in the history of the world, but you think that the political follow-through is lacking. What are the political roadblocks that China is facing now that are preventing this good economic plan from being implemented? Well, it, the economic plan, first of all, steps on the toes of every power group in China. So the first layer of problems is, is that there's an awful lot of pushback and that the infighting is, is terrific. Uh, the response to that is uh, a powerful hammer for hammering these resistant groups and that's the anti-corruption campaign. And so, uh, for instance, the the group that most doesn't like reform was the petroleum faction led by Zhou Yang Kang. So he's the first high level uh, victim, as it were. Uh, and that, that's a very powerful lever for getting rid of resistance. But it's so powerful that it scares everybody. Uh, and so, so the reform process is has gone uh, much slower than, than expected. 
you find fault with Chinese President Xi Jinping's decision making or lack thereof, uh, that he's not taking the necessary risks to move the country forward. Could you elaborate, please? The economic plan calls for marketizing the state enterprises, uh, but the political plan calls for strengthening the party committee in each enterprise and making sure that it has uh, at least veto over strategic business decisions. And so the politics and the economics are at odds. Uh, they have a pretty fundamental choice between fast reform and slow growth on the one hand, or fast growth and slow reform on the other hand. But in each case, the policy is we're going to have both. So th there's this uh, very serious tension between the economic side and the political side. You're not saying there's going to be a major political crisis in China, but you're saying that the way the Chinese leadership is operating now, uh, at least to date, isn't going to produce the results needed to move the economy forward to the next level of development. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, I think they've got a brilliant economic plan, but, but it's only being partially implemented. And one way to think about it is under Mao, it was politics in command. Under Deng Xiaoping, it was economics in command. And now it's sort of 60% politics in command and 40% economics in command. The, the, the other way to think about it is, in the early days, the, 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 the leaders were willing to take enormous risks to deliver economic benefits. Now, the, the attitude is very different. Now the risk is we're going to preserve every one of those levers of political control. Uh, and if the, if the economic side suffers, well, the, the important thing is, is the political control. Dr. Overholt, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having me.